There's a lot of careless purchases you can make online. A shirt that doesn't fit, a rug that's the wrong size. But what if you bought a house where you could hit your head on the ceiling? This house might have more in common with clothes and rugs because all of them can be folded up and bought on Amazon. These Amazon houses, portable prefabricated tiny home 13 by 20 feet, mobile expandable plastic prefab house for hotel, booth, office, guard house, shop, villa, warehouse, workshop with restroom. Yeah, have been purchased by TikTokers and YouTubers and presumably a few regular people. And they've been very popular in the headlines lately, but you've probably never seen one of these houses in real life. But there's a mail order house you've probably seen before. You just didn't know it. And it's a little bit older. They can look pretty good for their age though. Today, we're talking about mail order houses and how that business has changed from the 1920s to the 2020s. So let's start with the company that changed how products are bought. A place to buy practically everything. Underwear, hangers, wigs, books, cleaning supplies, candy, toys, all delivered to your house with the click. Well, not so much a click, more the scribble of a letter and a money order through the post office. Similar to Amazon, Sears and Roebuck was not the first mail order catalog, but it became a behemoth. It didn't just carry books or clothes, there was nothing too big or too small to be listed. Farm equipment, bobby pins, socks, dolls, sheds, toilets, strollers. It beat out many of its competitors by not just focusing on one category, but instead selling everything. Sound familiar? But a department created in 1895 to sell building materials wasn't that successful until it shifted the plan. It still sold the materials, but instead as a kit, where you could build a house from start to finish. The first catalog in 1908 offered 22 styles and a flat price for all the materials, which could arrive via train. All you had to do was have the land and pay for the labor to put it all together. From 1908 to 1940, they supplied 100,000 homes in the United States with 450 different designs. Their magazines always said modern homes on the cover because these homes were modern. Not like chic mid-century modern, more like there's a toilet inside. So these houses had electricity and plumbing. And when you compare it with the alternative, that is very modern. When ordering, their soon to be owners could see the exterior, see the floor plan and request alterations. Now, Amazon has a lot of similarities to the Sears story. And since they started to sell houses, you'd think that they'd have even more in common. But there's one key difference in how Amazon sells versus how that catalog did. Sure, you can get anything, but Amazon isn't necessarily the one selling it. And when they do, it's a bit of a moral gray area. Amazon is a marketplace where companies sell their products through the Amazon platform and Amazon gets a cut of those sales, which can add questions about safety and legitimacy of the listings. So when we say Amazon is selling houses, it's true they're selling it, but it's not really an Amazon house. Their name might be on all these articles, but it's actually a third party seller. So if you want more information about this seller, the furthest you can usually get is the listing and the seller page on Amazon, which just shows their other products. But let's see what we're getting when we buy this house. First off, I'm not really sure we should call this a house. The listing might say home, but it seems a bit like keyword soup. Like this would make for a gnarly game of connections. The way it works is the center is a corridor. This is how it's shipped. At the end of the corridor is a bathroom if you get one, and both other rooms fold out from the center section. The ceiling and the floors fold out first, followed by the wall parallel to the corridor, and then the front and the back walls hinge like doors. It slightly reminds me of a transformer, but instead of transforming from a killer car to a killer robot, it transforms from a room to a bigger room. Similar. Now, there are still a lot of questions that have not been answered. And the listing doesn't seem particularly interested in telling you much. How big is the bathroom? How tall are the ceilings? Is there electricity? It's not even clear if a kitchen's included. These are the questions you might want to know the answer to if you're making a $14,000 purchase. And that's not the only inconsistency. The listing says it has sliding doors, but it shows hinged doors. One part says equipped with full electrical wiring to USA standards, while further down it says electricity need to set up additionally. None of the photos suggest there is electricity, but hey, it's got four stars. How bad can it be? Oh, 
not one of those reviews is from a verified purchaser. But I've seen two examples of people buying these houses. One guy made a YouTube video which ends with a bunk bed on the roof and a grill doing this. Less explosively was this TikTok by a user who goes by Hugh Hefnerson. He bought a house on Amazon for $24,000 and then five days later he's at a facility where the house was getting dropped off and set up while he gets land and permitting sorted out. He says he'll be storing it there for $150 a week while he works through the legal location requirements. He was given some upgrades to the version he bought and was clearly in contact with people to get this set up, but immediately he's noticing some negatives. The short ceilings. The ceilings, I'm 5'8", so the ceilings are not like too high. They're very low. There is an electrical setup and he says it needs drywall, which also won't help make the ceilings any taller. But the biggest concern I have with the structure is how would you know that it was up to code in your state or city? The listing is so in detail that you might not know if you could legally have it as a single family home until you'd already purchased it. In California, ceilings have to be seven or seven and a half feet. It can't be a dwelling without electrical and you can't get a clear answer on the listing even if you needed it. When Sears was making modern homes, there were building codes, but the houses were most likely meeting those requirements. Although codes have existed in some form since the 1600s in the US, most of them were focused on fire prevention because you can only have your entire city burned down so many times before you say, hey everybody, um, let's all Let's all build with brick this time, okay? In the 1920s, a lot of local codes were focused on making sure water was sanitary going in and safely going out and that your house wasn't a pile of kindling. It wasn't until 1942 that a consolidated National Association of Home Builders was founded, which helped make more consistent rules across the nation with an added focus on structural safety to help ensure that houses that go up don't come down. And those Sears houses were not avoiding sending documentation. At the start of the 1936 catalog, they went through everything you could expect from their homes. The studs are 16 inches apart. The door and window frames are one and one eighteenth inch thick. The subfloors are one by six inch yellow pine. But most of all, if you had questions, there was information in writing and also a place and a person where you could bring questions or alterations to. And these houses had different levels and prices. If you were in a colder climate, they would recommend the honor built houses since the wood quality was higher. Standard built houses weren't pre-cut, so it was cheaper, but the labor costs could be higher. And the simplex sectional cottages were intended for summer use and didn't come with a plastered interior. So there were levels to the quality of these homes that correlated with the price. And there was information on that quality and price and what you could expect. Which brings us to a tricky situation with these houses that can be bought on Amazon. How do you know the quality? Reviews on Amazon are pretty inherently broken and are consistently traded for free or deeply discounted products. The information on the page contradicts itself and the price isn't a solid thing. When I first started writing this video, the house was 10,000. Now it's 14,000. And when you look at the past 60 days, the price has been as high as 36,000 and as low as $3,000. This is called repricing and when paired with reviews, it can be a way to shoot your listing to the top of the rankings for specific categories. Amazon is one of the most popular search engines. So gaming your rank on a search term like house can mean big moves for how your products are ranked and sold. But considering these prices seem erratic, let's see how the past adds up. I'll be using this house called The Fairy that looked like this from 1925 to 1930. I'm using it because I can use this audio. She was a fairy. And also it's on the smaller end. 616 square feet or 57 square meters for the more scientifically minded countries. This is one of the better comparisons to the unfoldable house. If the listing is correct, it's about 380 square feet or 35 square meters. Okay, the Sears one is a good amount bigger, but it's as small of an honor built house I could find with a full floor plan. So we're working with what we got. In 1929, it was selling for $993. And remember, this was just for the kit. It didn't include the labor to build it or the land. So in that way, it's somewhat similar to the Amazon house. Even though to set up this Amazon house, it sounds like it's a couple hours of labor, whereas most of these houses would at least take a couple of days. Using the Bureau of Labor and Statistics inflation calculator, that comes up to $17,909.83. 
which is kind of smack dab in the middle of prices the foldable house has been listed for. Lots of people bought these Sears houses, and there's a lot of people today who are trying to find more of those Sears houses history. So Sears House Seeker has been tracking the houses and their stories on their website. So this fairy house in St. Louis, which still looks the same with a small addition added to the back, they found out it was purchased and mortgaged by Mary Lacey in 1930. And according to census data, she was a 50 year old black woman who was widowed and worked as a laundress. And that's been the cool thing about diving into this topic. There is a group of people who are trying to verify so many Sears houses. They use the original mortgages and verify through the mortgage holders and addresses, along with being contacted by people who think they live in Sears houses. Their goal is to confirm that a Sears house is actually a Sears house. But in the meantime, they uncover the people who lived in these homes and who originally ordered them from a catalog. Like Charles O'Brien, a sheet metal worker with a Sears sunlight in Cincinnati, Ohio or Hazel Blair, a writer who lived with her sister in a Sears Ellsmore in Kirkwood, Missouri, and Caleb Pierce, a fruit farmer with a Sears Elmwood in Normal, Illinois. Lots of people were buying these houses, and those people were people. They had their own life story. And what might have drawn them to a Sears house was they had a reputation for quality and affordability. One of the ways Sears kept prices down was owning a lumber plant where these kits were sent from. For the honor built, the wood was pre-cut for its needs with different letters and numbers printed on the wood. That would make it quicker and easier for builders to put together this 3D puzzle. And this business was successful in many ways. So what took down this department of Sears? Well, one of the pieces that grew the division would hurt it later. In 1911, Sears started offering loans. By 1918, they could offer some of the material and some of the labor on credit. These loans would be paid off monthly over five years with 6% interest. Over time, they started supervising the home construction and labor and including all those costs in the loan. Individuals weren't their only customer. During World War I, they supplied hospitals to the Red Cross and entire neighborhoods were built for corporations near their factories, like 192 houses built in Carlinville, Illinois in 1918 for Standard Oil. But when the stock market crashed in 1929, they didn't change their loan policy, instead expanding them with construction and labor baked in. But the depression kept depressing. In a 1934 report, it was announced that about 11 million in mortgages were liquidated during the year, which in today's money would be about 250 million. In that same report, they announced that modern homes would discontinue, but they technically pronounced it dead a little early. It continued on for five more years, now without loans and contracting, which wasn't as appealing to customers who probably like me, hate talking to more than one person. Now, when I was editing this, I felt like something was weird about that year. 1934 was also the year Congress passed the National Housing Act, which created the Federal Housing Administration and insured house mortgages. Through 1934 and 1935, many Americans would have refinanced their existing mortgages at a lower rate on a different time period. This meant Sears probably got a lot of their lost loans back from this federal refinancing. And that's possibly why it went from pronounced dead to still around. But Sears was also not a bank, so they could no longer offer those house loans, meaning they would have lost out on the most profitable part of their business, the loan interest. It's worth noting that although the FHA and the insuring of these loans was intended to create more stability in housing, it also built racism into the backbone of mortgages in the US. Mortgages were now insured, and with the cover of risk management, clear discrimination against Black Americans was occurring, which you can see in this underwriting manual from 1936, this was really how redlining became a government institution. Now back to Sears, they couldn't do housing loans anymore. But houses kept selling with sales bopping between 2 million and 4 million a year. That still wasn't enough to keep the department standing, which had grown to 20 offices and 150 salesmen. When it sold the lumber plant in 1940, it was the final breath for Sears modern homes. Now I hope it's been clear that we're comparing two extremely different things. An entire house with all the fixings sold by a catalog in a different century versus a foldable structure sold on Amazon. The trouble I'm having is every news article taking these Amazon listings at face value. It says home in the title. It must be a house. Sure, the listing does say home, but it also says booth. They use the title portable prefabricated tiny home 30 by 20 feet mobile expandable plastic prefab house for hotel, booth, office, guardhouse, shop, villa, warehouse, workshop, with restroom. Because it was so chock full of keywords, they thought that they could get more clicks. And just because
because an artificial intelligence keyword picker chose these words doesn't mean we all have to believe them. When I see this, I'm not seeing a house. It looks like it could be good storage or used as an outbuilding. It could be used as a home or a shelter. But I think in many towns and cities, you would struggle to get this permitted as a single family residence. I think in some places, you might even struggle to put this in the backyard of a pre-existing house as an accessory dwelling unit. There is a difference between what something can be used for and what it is. And I think it's important that we don't all agree that this is all it takes. A place without electricity that you shouldn't stay in if it storms. These are temporary solutions that I wish weren't so appealing and necessary right now. And I know Sears houses had their problems, but people who bought these houses had a place to live. And they're now houses that have been lived in for over a hundred years. In Carlinville, Illinois, Almost all of those houses are still around. And Kit House Hunters have found and identified 16,000 Sears houses as of 2023. On the last page of the 1908 Sears catalog, right before the Sears houses would really take off, there is a full page devoted to price and quality, advertising how they provide a low price, but still maintain high quality. And in the most melodramatic copy I've ever seen, we are being attacked by the hundreds of thousands of retail dealers wholesale dealers, manufacturers, salesmen, etc., in all lines of merchandise in all parts of the United States. And honestly, some days when you're trying to buy a dish rack that doesn't suck or a vacuum that does, you're also being attacked by hundreds of thousands of third-party sellers. And it feels like reviews and rankings have become a game to pretend that there's quality, even when there isn't. We've based our online shopping experience on a website that never checks for quality and only for price. And I personally hadn't really been loving the results. So before you buy a shirt or a rug or a building structure on Amazon, make sure you check the return policy and don't end up paying rent to store a house that you can't even live in. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. This month on my Patreon, I'll be speed building some of my favorite Sears houses in The Sims 4. I've got tons of other videos on there and on here. So if you want more, there's more. Bye.